Will Dornell Wright be a first-round draft pick this year for Tennessee? All the talk was maybe Jalen Hyatt's, maybe Hendon Hooker a little bit, but is it going to be the offensive tackle Dornell Wright? Had a great week down in Mobile. We're going to talk on that and a whole lot more here on your Monday, Locked On Balls. You are Locked On Balls, your daily podcast on the Tennessee Volunteers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, everybody? Welcome to it. This is Locked on Vols, and I'm your host, Eric Kane. So glad that you guys elected to hang out with me here on your Monday on Locked on Vols. It is your team every single day. It's a part of Locked on Podcast Network, and it's brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs, where you can hire qualified candidates more efficiently by matching open roles with the people who have those same skills, values, and experiences to help you achieve your 2023 goals. Post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash Locked on College. Terms and conditions do apply. All right, so we got a loaded show coming up here on a Monday. We're going to talk some more Senior Bowl. Darnell Wright, a really, really good week. Chris Gordy will join the show, Locked On SEC host in Segment 2. And then Tennessee basketball, it survived. It did get a top 25 victory over the Auburn Tigers, but it was ugly with some elite defense shaded in there as well. So all that and more here on your Monday, Locked On Vols. All right, so Darnell Wright. Uh, Darnell Wright had a really, really good Senior Bowl. Um, he had a really good week in the Senior Bowl, and there's some conversation now that he could slide into the top 31 picks of this NFL draft. Now, remember, there's only 31 picks in the NFL uh, first round this year because uh, of the, uh, I believe it was the Miami Dolphins uh, had their first round pick taken away due to uh, a situation a couple years ago. But nonetheless, 31 picks in the first round of the NFL draft this year, and there's some talk that, hey, Darnell Wright, Tennessee offensive tackle, could slide into one of those. Now, there's a long way to go between now and April 28th. Uh, there's pro days, there's NFL combines, there's tons of different mock drafts and interviews and all that type of stuff out there. So we will see if that holds true at some point in time. But uh, there was so much talk about Darnell Wright this past week. We'll start off with just some of the tweets from various people who were down there covering the uh, Senior Bowl that that I bookmarked throughout the week and really from over the weekend. Uh, Louis Reddick, who's a you know an ESPN NFL Network uh, talent, a, a former front office personnel who obviously knows what he's looking at and trying to draft somebody, said um, he said standouts for me over the last two days of seeing the Senior Bowl up close and personal. He listed a bunch of players. At offensive line, he put Darnell Wright. He goes on in the series of tweets. It's a screen grab of Tennessee playing Alabama this past football season and a screen grab of Darnell Wright blocking Will Anderson Jr. It says, watching Vol football's offensive tackle Darnell Wright handle Bama's defensive end Will Anderson Jr. and pass pro as if he was just another guy on the field. I emoji and stunned emoji. And he said, this is how I'll be spending every single night up until the NFL draft. Uh, you, Evan Lazar who is a staff writer and co-host of uh, Patriots Catch 22 at Patriots.com. He said, I know I'm a broken record on this, but off the tackle group is so good this year. Paris Johnson, Broderick Jones, a couple other guys, Antoine Harrison, uh, Dewan Jones, and Darnell Wright, all potential day one starters. I mentioned what uh, ESPN's Mike Tannenbaum said last week, who, of course, is a former NFL general manager and off the tackle uh, this is what he had to say on Darnell Wright. This is before the game on Saturday. This guy has it all. He's got 40-plus game starter. All SEC, he's had an unbelievable week. I think he's working himself into a first round. You put on the Alabama tape, and he was just magnificent. And so uh, a lot of praise for Tennessee's Darnell Wright uh, here in the Senior Bowl. And before the game, this came down Friday afternoon, uh, the peers, the players themselves who take practice and who take part in practice all week long, uh, going up against the various uh, you know teammates and uh, the other teams, you know pass rushers and one on ones and all that type of stuff. They vote on practice players of the week, and from the peers, uh, the members of the Senior Bowl voted Darnell Wright the offensive lineman practice player of the week for the American team. And what an accomplishment there! An awesome prize. VolQuest.com caught up with Darnell Wright, and here's a quick little audio blurb. This is what Darnell Wright kind of said in his reaction to. Uh, winning that award yeah all of them are um because it was from my peers you know the guys that i'm actually going against and earning the respect of those guys um uh, i don't know if i would have cared much if it was from like a coach or some official person you know what i mean um i think it just meant all the more to me that it was uh 
my peers, the guys that I actually battled with and competed with day in and day out. Good stuff there from Darnell Wright. And, and it, I feel like it was just, I mean, it was evident, right? I mean, he was he was going to go down there and whip some tail, and he was going to have a great week. And um, he's got the size. He's got the experience. He's young to be a 40-plus game starter in the Southeastern Conference. He's only 21 years of age, barely. He wanted to come back to Tennessee, but smartly, somebody in his corner said, hey, you need to go ahead and go right now because there's a chance you can make some serious life-changing money for you and your family, and that's what he's going to do. We'll see if he will make it into the first round. A lot of time between now and then, but uh, Darnell Wright might be Tennessee's best chance at landing a first-round draft pick for this 2023 NFL draft. Another guy that's been you know highly talked about this week and really all college football season, it's been quarterback Hendon Hooker, and we know Hendon Hooker still recovering from an ACL injury. Uh, we heard from him when he caught up with Chris Gordy, who's going to be our guest here in just a couple of moments. Uh, I've logged on SEC, heard a lot of that interview and just kind of you know what his process has been like and recovering and looking back at the season that was and now looking ahead uh, to the uh, to the NFL draft process and kind of what he thinks about meeting with NFL teams and all that. But also, there's been a lot of chatter about how he's helped himself out just by meeting with teams, by doing interviews, by sitting in the meeting rooms and going over tape and all that type of stuff. We know Hinton Hooker is incredibly smart, uh, but it, it's usually not the case when a guy's hurt that he still goes down to the Senior Bowl and, and takes part in all the festivities, obviously not practice and, and the game, but still takes part in everything else. Typically, those spots are allocated for players who are going to play in the game. Um, again, this is, not a, this is not a usual circumstance for somebody injured to go through like they are with Hinton Hooker. Has it ever been done before? Yes, but that was during the COVID-2020 season. Uh, Jim Nagy, who is the uh, founder of the Reese's Senior Bowl and who kind of puts all that together, he joined the Paul Feinbaum show last week and was asked about Hendon Hooker being down there in Mobile. And a lot of high praise here from uh, the Senior Bowl director himself. This is on Tennessee's quarterback, Hendon Hooker. It was kind of a one-off decision on that one, Paul. You know, we, we usually wouldn't let a player that was injured come down here and participate. We did do that during the COVID year with like guys like Landon Dickerson and Devontae Smith. But that was a unique, unique case, unique year. There was nothing else in the draft process that year. Uh, we, were, we were the only show in the, in the draft process. So we were trying to do the right thing. Um, some agents have tried to <laughs> talk us into doing that again. But Hendon's a special case. He's a quarterback. The meeting room time, the interviews is so important for that position. Um, and Hen you know, Hendon was the talk of college football for about two-thirds of the season and such a special young guy that, that we wanted to make that exception. But he's had a good week. He's been in the meeting rooms all week. He's been connected with his teammates on the field, uh, really showing off his leadership. So it's, it's, been, it's been fun having Hendon down here. So a great week for Darnell Wright, a great week for Hendon Hooker, and Tennessee's Byron Young was also down there, and he was being tweeted about, and I saw a bunch of different videos of him winning one-on-one -on -one drills on the edge. A good experience for him. So uh, we'll see how these guys, along with the other draft-eligible players from Tennessee, including Jerome Carvin, Jeremy Banks, and Princeton Fant, who took part in the Shrine Bowl earlier last week, uh, Latrell Bumpus, who took part in the NFL PA Bowl uh, the week before last, and some other guys. Uh, how they do in pro days coming up, NFL combines and uh, all that type of stuff, still months away, but a really good week for the Power T down in Mobile, uh, Alabama. All right, more on that. That is coming up next with Chris Gordy of Locked On SEC. He is going to join the show when we return right here on Locked On Vols. But first, I want to tell you, guys, tell you guys about our friends over at LinkedIn Jobs. They are a fantastic partner, proud sponsor of the Locked On Podcast Network, and as a small business owner or hiring manager, you know that success in 23 all depends on the team members that you surround yourself with. And that's why you got to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs, can hire, you can hire qualified candidates more efficiently by matching open roles with people who have the skills, values, experiences to help you achieve those goals. They help you chat quickly with qualified candidates to your open jobs and targeting tools. They go beyond the resume, resume data by using insights from your job post company and their 875 million member profiles to put your post in front of the most qualified candidates available. Identify the most qualified candidates at LinkedIn Jobs and connect with them fast and for free. It's why small businesses ranked LinkedIn Jobs number one and delivering qualified hires versus its leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster and for free. Go ahead and post your job for free. That is at linkedin.com slash locked on college. LinkedIn.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions do apply. 
All right, guys, it's your Monday edition of Locked On Vols. Appreciate you guys hanging out with me here today. Don't forget, tomorrow is Tuesday. Send in your questions, comments, concerns, anything you guys have on Tennessee football, basketball, baseball, recruiting, all that and more. We'll answer those on tomorrow's show. Uh, talking Senior Bowl from Mobile. That game was held on Saturday, but of course, the week and the preparation and all that. That was all last week, and uh, here to... Here to uh, talk to us about that and break that down as a guy that was in the stands watching all of it. That is Chris Gordy, host of Locked On SEC. What's up, Chris? What's going on, Eric? Yeah, it's uh, it's a fun week. It's a busy week. It's nonstop for for not just the media that's there, but the players as well. I mean, uh, just to give some people a little peek behind the scenes, you know, those first couple nights when the players get there, uh, you know, you're going through practices and media obligations and all that all day, and then at night. You're meeting with 16 dif different reps from different teams each night that you're there. So it really is. It's long days. It's a little sleep. Um, and the guys are really put put through it. And, and then at the end of it, you still got to play football. Like that's yeah. the crazy part of it. So uh, it's a it's a cool process. Um, you know, I had some people ask me, why wasn't Levis there and all that? It's the senior bowl. No underclassmen. You have to be a senior to go. But uh, it's a great opportunity for guys who played four years of college to go showcase their talents. You know, off the top, what would you say to those people that might say, hey, Senior Bowl is not that big of a deal. In fact, it's players that weren't good enough to get their first crack at the NFL when they were initially eligible. Um, kind of the rebounds, if you will. I saw a little, uh, not many, because of course, each player blossoms and blooms in different areas. They go on to be first round picks and NFL Hall of Famers who played in this game. But what would you say to that kind of narrative out there? No, I think it's it's absolutely, you know, a week that improve, can improve a guy's draft stock. Um, I don't know many guys who necessarily have hurt their stock outside of, you know, guys who've gone and gotten injured. But uh, there's been some guys who definitely improved their stock. I mean, for instance, I was talking with a scout this week who said DJ Dale from Alabama. He had originally had pinned as, you know, like a mid, mid to late round guy and uh, you know, said that he thought he would be just a rotational piece or, you know, a backup in the NFL. And he said after what he saw this week in the Senior Bowl, he said, I got him pinned as a starter in the NFL, an every down starter. And so it's just little things like that. And again, it's it sounds hyperbolic to go, oh, yeah, three days of practice is going to change that. Yeah, because the same thing happens at the combine, too. You know, you see a guy run a 40 and he runs faster than you thought. Suddenly, you know, OK, well, pencil that guy in. I had him as a second. He's now locked to be a first round pick. And Darnell Wright was one of those risers this week. He was a guy that impressed a lot of people. And, you know, the latest buzz I was hearing from people later in the week was they think back into the first round. If you're a team that really needs a, uh, a right tackle, that, that they think Darnell Wright showed enough this week to improve his draft stock. So, again, it, it's different opinions. Scouts and coaches have different opinions than the guys, the bloggers and the guys who write the, the, the uh, mock drafts and all that. So, take everything with a grain of salt, right? I'm sure yeah. there might be a team might have Darnell right off their board. You know, it's just, it's the weirdness that goes with this whole evaluation process, but at least most of the people I talked to this week came away very, very impressed with Darnell Wright. Yeah, I think from Tennessee's perspective, you know, Byron Young was there and he went through drills and, and I saw him show up on a couple of lists, you know, after practice day one and two and it sounded like he had a pretty decent week, but, you know, all the talk was Darnell Wright and Hinton Hooker, even though Hinton Hooker didn't participate um, for, for Darnell Wright, you kind of went in on it there a little bit. What are some of the things you heard about what scouts and, and NFL personnel like what they saw in terms of his traits on the field? What does he do well? And, and how big of a deal is it for him to win that, uh, that, that American practice offensive lineman of the week award? I know they give a lot of those out and everything, but still it's a pretty unique because again, it's voted on by his peers. Yeah, that's, that's what's so cool is that the D linemen voted on it. So it was the guys he was going up against all voted him the, the best. Um, there's a few things, and I'm not – I'm no offensive line expert. I love watching uh, the offensive linemen go at it and and love to see the the trench work. But uh, just talking with some people that were there, what they do like about Darnell Wright is – uh, his ability to bring guys to the ground, like off the initial snap, that happened a couple times in practice this week where he goes one-on-one -on -one with a guy and, boom, brings him down uh, immediately. I think there was a clip of uh, him doing that in the Florida game this year where, you know, his, right off the snap, guy comes at him, boom, he puts him on the ground. Um, the other thing that I heard this week was at least one of the things he needs to work on is, like, his lateral recovery. So on, on the initial snap where, you, you know, you come back and you take your guy and he starts to get around you, and kind of evens you out. 
keep, you know, if you're, if you're getting beat, you got to be able to recover yourself. And that was one of the things that they were saying Darnell Wright was having some issues with. Again, this is very nitpicky. This is very deep into the woods on off at the <laughs> wide talk. But again, it's just some of those things that I heard this week talking with people who, again, were, were pretty high on, Dar- on Darnell Wright. But again, if you're talking about being a, a, you know, maybe sneaking into that back end of the first round, I mean, every, literally every hangnail count, like everything counts. I mean, what he had for breakfast three years ago counts. It's ridiculous. The stuff that these guys take into account to where you can find, uh, you know, really good football players anywhere in this draft as we've seen. Um, so on Darnell Wright, we'll move on to Hendon Hooker, um, a guy that didn't, you know, go through practice, didn't play in the game, but I mean, you know, th- th- if it feels like everybody was saying great things about him, it was it, I don't want to say it was an easy week for him. Of course, he wasn't out there competing, but I mean, it, you know, he just had to show up and say the right things and, and kind of show everybody who he was. And I feel like he did a great job in that regard. So, how much you know did Hendon Hooker help himself out this week, not being able to throw a football? I think he helped himself out a lot because you know I, I know you guys played part of my interview with him uh, oh, at yeah. Senior Bowl, but he's just a genuinely good dude. And uh, again, the NFL is always looking for that. There's a reason why. They ask so many questions about your background and your family and where you're from. Uh, he's a guy who's big into his faith, which is big. Teams like that. They like guys who are morally grounded, um, things like that. So, uh, and and he's a little charming. I mean, when you talk to him, you're like, you can't help but not like Hendon Hooker when you talk to him. He's just a good guy. So you, you take all that into account, plus the football aspect. And, uh, you know, I was surprised kind of talking with him. He said how, how good his recovery is, is coming along. And that the expectation, at least this is their expectation, is that he's going to be ready to go by camp. Now, I didn't press him on, does that mean rookie camp? Does that mean training camp into July? Like, I didn't get a full timeline, but he thinks he's going to be ready to go at, at worst for the start of this season. And that plays into, you know, where a team maybe takes him. And uh, the one team that I heard, you know, this week at the Senior Bowl to maybe keep an eye on, was part of a, a, a trade that went down, and that was the Denver Broncos trading for Sean Payton and sending the 29th overall pick to New Orleans. The Saints are in desperate need of a quarterback. 29 is definitely in play for Hendon Hooker. I know a lot of people have him pinned as a second rounder, but you know when you talk about the quarterbacks that are going to go, we're going to see Bryce Young. We're going to see Will Levis and C.J. Stroud all go top 10. Anthony Richardson, at least from what I'm hearing now, is going to go somewhere in the middle of the first. That if this If it all plays out that way, Hendon Hooker could be in play for the Saints because you get that fifth-year option by taking the guy in the first round. You know, some people say, why not just wait for the second? No, you take that quarterback, you get that five years, and, you know, the scenario I've heard from with New Orleans is maybe they would bring Andy Dalton back on a, on a one-year deal, start Andy Dalton, let Hendon be the backup, and if Hendon beats him out, then great. You know, the Saints will roll with it. But, um, you know, that's why I asked Hendon last week. I said, would you be – are you looking to start immediately? And he said, look, there's some benefits to – sitting and learning absolutely he gets that but he said the competitor in him wants to play immediately he wants to be the guy that that, that starts you know in year one in the nfl so uh yeah i think De- hendon definitely helped this case you know in, in stark contrast i think stetson bennett made a terrible decision at georgia not going to the senior bowl you know goes and gets arrested working out in, in dallas by himself so um yeah tremendous week for hendon hooker from the aspect of even if you can't play football, at least you could impress the the scouts and coaches with uh, your interview, your football knowledge. And one thing that stood out to me was, you know, he talked about how Josh Heupel trusted him so much with this offense that he had the ability to to change change plays mm-hmm. to whatever he wants. And so often we hear with college quarterbacks, well, here's the play and here's your audible. You know, it's two plays. With Hendon, he had full landscape to change, check into whatever he wanted to at any time. And I think that's going to help him big time at the next level because that's what they expect NFL quarterbacks to be able to do. So it doesn't it doesn't seem like his age is really going to hurt him that much right now at this point in the in the process, right? Because he is twenty five. Yeah, there will be some people who mark him for that. There's people who are marking off Bryce, Bryce Young because of his height. They, they're all looking for reasons to knock you. You know, what I mean, yeah, that, yeah. that's always what teams are looking for. But look, if you want a guy who's going to come in and, and ready to learn down, this maybe goes back to the aspect of not sitting and learning. You know, if they think he can come in and start from day one, maybe some teams look at that a little bit more because they're like, well, he's already up there at age. So you really want him to sit a whole year in the NFL? Let's get this guy going in here. So I think that'll that'll help his cause. And, uh, yeah, I'm excited to see what he can do, man. Uh, you know, I brought up the the possibility. Maybe a team that really likes him ends up with one of the, the ball receivers, you know, whether it's it's Tide or, or Tillman. And, um, you know, that he, he kind of liked that idea. Not – 
you know, not likely to happen. But if that were to happen, man, it'd be so cool. And I know a lot of Tennessee fans would be buying the jerseys of whatever team those guys end up on. You know, there's already a pipeline. Like, I, I, when, when you're talking like there, I just keep seeing New Orleans in my mind. There's already that pipeline of so many balls in New Orleans or in Pittsburgh. So, you know, we'll have to see exactly what happens for Hendon Hooker. But uh, chatter now, potentially, maybe, maybe with New Orleans in the late end of the first round, uh, likely second round. And then, of course, Darnell Wright potentially sliding into a late uh, first round draft pick as well. Quite a haul for Tennessee. We'll see what happens later on. Um, last thing I want to ask you, and this isn't really ball related, but it does kind of pertain to Hendon Hooker a little bit, I guess. You're not his coach. You're not his trainer. Um, you know, but you did just mention Stetson Bennett. I mean, why on earth would a guy like Stetson Bennett not want to go to the senior bowl? I mean, he's a two-time national champion, but the odds are still against him. That's just kind of his mantra. Like, I felt like he needed this senior bowl, and lo and behold, he doesn't go. And then, of course, as you mentioned, he goes and, and gets into some trouble. Yeah, I, a few people I talked to at the senior bowl asking them about the the – you know, the case of Stetson Bennett is I heard a little bit of arrogance, a little bit of cockiness on his part. You know, he's a guy who we, we talk and we celebrate. Oh, my God, the, the walk on that that earned his spot. And oh, my God, can you believe this? Not one, but two time national champion, undefeated season, all this. And we hyped him up so much that I think a little of it. He started humble. But I think it kind of went to his head as this all yeah. went along. And it was like when you keep being told how great you are, how great you are, how great you are. I think that did kind of get to him a little bit. And, um, you know, I, you know, it carried over until a little bit when they were having the championship parade. You know, there were talk, there was talk of he was just on his phone and not really, like, waving to people and saying thanks and all that kind of stuff. And then they carry over to the Senior Bowl where I thought, you know, the quarterback play was atrocious all last week. I thought, man, with a healthy Hendon Hooker and a Stetson Bennett, they could have been studs at yeah. the Senior Bowl all last week. But – Unfortunately, uh, he chose not to. He chose to go to Dallas to work out on his own or with, you know, people there and ends up getting arrested after getting drunk for, you know, public intox. So it uh, it wasn't a great week. That's not to say he can't rebound and, um, you know, impress some teams and do well at the combine and maybe go somewhere in the middle rounds and a team gets a good player. But that's what I was told was maybe a little bit of arrogance on Stetson's part, thinking he could go in there and just uh, – you know, hey, look, my resume speaks for itself. I won two national championships. Well, that's great, dude, but this is the NFL. It's a different game here. Chris, appreciate it, man. Uh, great work this past week. Thanks so much for that sit-down with Hendon. I know uh, the listeners and viewers of this podcast really enjoyed that. Uh, what do you have coming up uh, this week on Locked on SEC? Yeah, well, let's think we still have a couple more interviews we, we got from last week with some of the SEC guys. We had some great ones that dropped on Friday at LSU's Ali Gay and uh, Zach Pickett's from South Carolina and – Again, even if you're a, a fan of opposing SEC team, I think it's kind of cool to, to hear what some of these guys have to say because Zach Pickens said going up against the former SEC guys like Darnell Wright helped make him better and, and help improve your draft stock because, you know, you, the, the best versus the best helps breed excellence. So it's exciting. And then we'll start to turn the page in the next couple of weeks, Eric, start to look at some of the spring games. I know Vol fans are so psyched to see what, what this team could do with Joe Milton at the helm and, uh, Sky's the limit, man. I, I don't know if they can be if, if next season can be as special as this one, but maybe, you know, um, maybe better in, in different aspects where they kind of fell short last year. Chris Gordy, host of Locked On SEC. Thanks so much for your time, man. Anytime, Eric. All right. Awesome stuff there from Chris Gordy. Please check out Locked On SEC. Make that your second lesson today and every day. Make it a part of your morning routine. Locked On SEC behind Locked On Balls. All right, when we come back, we'll check in that Tennessee basketball win over Auburn. It took a couple of years off your life, of course. But, hey, uh, it was a good defensive showing, so that is something in itself to celebrate. Elite defense from Tennessee, that and more coming up next on Locked on Vols. But, hey, if you're looking for a delicious treat but don't want all the fat and the calories, you got to try Built Bar. I uh, just got through the holidays. I know that's my goal and some of your guys' goal probably likely is to, you know, check out, uh, try to lose some weight and find some healthy treats. And, and that's why you got to try Built Built is healthy. It's actually tasty. Seriously, they're so delicious and they're good for you. Perfect for that New Year's resolution. What makes Built Bar so good? Well, for starters, they're covered in 100% real chocolates. That's right, real chocolates. Uh, unbelievable flavors like peanut butter, brownie, coconut almond, and more. I'm not sure how Built Bar does it, but these bars are like candy bars while maintaining 
great things for you. Uh, healthy, 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, a whopping 17 grams of protein. And now you don't have to win on your box to be shipped. For years, we've been telling you to go to build.com and make your order today. But now you can go to your local Walmart or Sam's Club. That's right. Head to your nearest Walmart today, walk to the pharmacy section, grab yourself a box of Bilt Bars. You can just pick up a four box of cookies and cream, double chocolate, and coconut puffs if you like. If you're close to Sam's Club, run in and grab a 13-bar box with hit flavors like brownie batter and churro. You can thank me later. So now at Walmart or your local Sam's Club, and as always, order Built at Built.com. All right, guys, we got a final segment left here of your Monday edition. That is Locked On Balls, your team every single day. Twitter Tuesday is coming up tomorrow. Get in your uh, questions, your comments, concerns, all that and more. It's Twitter Tuesday, your mailbag edition of the show. That is coming up tomorrow. All right, Tennessee did improve to 19-4, and 8-2 and two in the SEC with a 46-43 win over Auburn Saturday afternoon. Oh, my goodness. This is why we don't watch a whole lot of basketball, right? I mean, for those of you that don't like the sport of basketball, for those of you that are a casual Tennessee basketball fan, this game right here is why. Now, on one hand, Tennessee's suffocating defense, the number one defense in the country, uh, the um, you know the, the they they put the analogy on the on the broadcast on Saturday of the I think it was a python, some type of snake. I forgot how it just you know just just crushes its opponent. It's it chokes them out literally, it just suffocates them. Right? I mean that's what this defense was. Auburn shot on the day twenty three percent from the field. It shot eleven percent from three point land. It was 13 of 55 overall in the field in this basketball game. I mean, that is some fantastic defense. It forced 12 turnovers. Um, it was, let's see here, Tennessee was able to out-rebound Auburn in this game. I mean, it had a, obviously it lost the game, so it had a, it had a minus, you know, plus minus uh, differential. But nonetheless, I mean, Tennessee's defense did a job. It held only, you know, two players in the double figures in this basketball game, and really only one, two, three, four, five players scored for Auburn in this basketball game. So that was the good sign of things, right? Tennessee's defense stayed on par. Oh, but on the flip side, it's you're kind of in that lull here with Tennessee's offense again. It was not a good showing in Gainesville with that midweek loss to Florida on Wednesday, and the offense didn't get any better. In fact, it regressed. Tennessee shot 27% from the field in this basketball game. Tennessee shot 9.5% from three-point land in this basketball game. It was even horrible at the charity stripe. It was 10 to 17, 58% from the freebies. Tennessee made only 17 of 63 attempts in this game, two of 21 from three-point land. Oh, my goodness. It was horrible. And so for those that casually watch Tennessee basketball, this is the game you can point to to say, this is why I don't watch basketball. It is not entertaining. However, again, we you know there's a two-sided coin. We're going to grab another coin and flip to one side of it. Uh, a win's a win, okay? You are not going to apologize for any type of win, especially in the SEC, especially against a top 25 team. Um, Auburn was a top 25 team. It will not be a top 25 team when the poll comes out uh, later today, but uh, that's just part of it. The, the, the Tigers fall to 17-6, and 7-3 and three in the SEC. Again, Tennessee improves to 19-4, and 8-2 and two in the SEC. Not a good shooting night overall for anybody. Olivier Cumwa, who was so aggressive early in this basketball game, but just, just couldn't find the bottom of the net. I love the aggressiveness from Olivier. It really did. I think he was like 0 for his first four attempts from the field, but I love the aggressiveness. Um, he only finished 4 of 16 from the field, nine points in this basketball game. Josiah Jordan James, boy, if not for him, Tennessee would be in a world of hurt. He had a good game, 15 points, uh, 5 of 12 shooting. Not good from uh, behind the three-point arc, but 1 of 7 from that regard. But 5 of 12 overall in the game, 15 points. Uh, he had 14 rebounds, double-double effort there, had an assist, only had one turnover. 15 point, 14 rebound, double-double for Josiah Jordan James. What a performance. He was the only Tennessee Volunteers in double figures on the day. Olivia Cumwa, as I mentioned, finished with nine points. Santiago Vescovi, who didn't shoot an awful lot, he just didn't look right in this game. And really, he's going through something. He's been going through something all season long. He hadn't looked right in, in quite some time, to be completely honest. Two of seven overall from the field, one of six from three, finished with seven points. However, he did do vengeance soggy, Santi towards the end of the game to where he had the old fashioned four point play. Uh, he had a late, his only three pointer made of the game was late in that second half where you know, he, he drew some contact there and made it and then went to the charity strap and, and, and finished that four point play. Um, it was an ugly game. It was not a good game for Zakai Ziegler, who went over from the field. He finished with three points. He was three of three from the uh, 
uh, from the free throw line, but he was 0 of 10 from the field, 0 of 7 from three point land. He had six assists. He had three turnovers. He did not have a good game whatsoever. And Julian Phillips was pretty much a non factor. He had three total rebounds, two points, one of three from the field. Didn't do an awful lot of anything. Uh, Jonas Adu, I thought he came on and rebounded pretty well at times, finished the game with seven rebounds, but he just gives you nothing offensively, absolutely nothing. Tyreek Key continues to be an absolute non-factor. He's giving you absolutely nothing. Jemai Meshack came on and played hard, but he's just a little too spazzy. Toby Awaka, I thought, came on and gave him some good minutes, four rebounds, finished with two points. And then Uros, I mean, I was talking with one of my buddies on Saturday, and I know we listen to this podcast. I just, I mean... I like his hustle. I think he's a really good teammate, but oh my gosh, he played 11 minutes and 46 seconds. In my opinion, that's 11 minutes and 46 seconds too long. Um, goodness, he just he just doesn't give you much right now, and especially away from home. So uh, that was not a great game, but Tennessee did get the win and again did beat a, a ranked opponent. And that's why you got to say I've seen the argument, well, I mean, Tennessee's defense has to be elite. Tennessee defense has to be elite in order for them to win. That's not always the case. It was on Saturday. Tennessee defense had to be elite on Saturday for them to win. That is not always the case. I mean, Tennessee, again, though it won't be the best shooting team on the on the court every single night, it will not be shooting 27% uh, from the field every single night. I know we did on Wednesday, but Tennessee's got to find a way out of this little hole right now because offensively, you are putting so much pressure on your defense to win you games when your defense, it's so good anyway. It's usually just a compliment to go along uh, with with the way the way you've been winning games so far this season, but that's just not really been the case the last two games. So uh, Tennessee should you know get back and uh, feel good about themselves. They got a game against Vanderbilt coming up on Wednesday, uh, so an opportunity to try to get the offense back uh, in rhythm. You need it big time because you are. Moving on through this SEC schedule, and before you know it, it is going to be turn tournament time. It was an ugly game, that is for sure, but Tennessee did get the win, 46-43, and basketball is wide open this year. That's what I'll say here in closing. I mean, you might be discouraged, you might be upset because you're such a fan of Tennessee basketball, and, and I mean, that's fine, but Purdue lost. Um, you saw how many teams lost last week. You saw, many, saw how many teams lost the week before in the top 10. Basketball this year, it is wide open. Anybody, anybody could win the whole thing when it's all said and done. So uh, Tennessee's got just as good of a chance to win it all as anybody else. I wholeheartedly believe that. Uh, we'll see what Tennessee looks like against Vanderbilt later in the week. That is going to do it for this edition of Locked on Balls. Big thanks to Chris Gordy for stopping by the show and giving us his perspective from down there in Mobile. Big thank you guys for sending in your Twitter Tuesday questions for the Mobag show that is coming up tomorrow. And uh, look forward to all that, guys. So really, really do appreciate it. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel, like this video, and uh, as always, listen to it wherever you find your podcast. Same time, same place. We will do it again tomorrow on a Tuesday. This is Locked on Balls.